He's Tom Verducci back here on the show. How are you, Tom? I'm doing well. I just came out of the Giancarlo Stanton press conference. Okay. So uh, what did you glean from that press conference that you might not uh, already have known, Tom? Well, I like his advice, Stanton's advice to Marlins fans. Hang in there. <laughs> you know, he made it clear that there's no structure there. Every year is different. And the next couple of years, at least, are going to be extremely difficult in Miami. So, listen, this thing came about uh, because of the ownership change, especially because uh, Giancarlo had that no trade clause. It was one thing to get a $325 million contract. It was another one to have a blanket no trade clause. Jeter and the Marlins were over a barrel. And uh, the Yankees, I think they got a bargain when you think about what they're uh, inheriting in terms of money and the player, what they gave up. It couldn't work out any better for New York. So let's let's take on some of these storylines right here. Uh, what do you say to the notion that Jeter uh, did this as a Manchurian pinstripe candidate, <laughs> Tom, for the Yankees? And no, I mean, listen, this was driven completely by money. This was a salary dump. When you look at what the Yankees, what the Marlins got back in terms of talent, this was about the team that would take on the most remaining dollars on that contract, and that was the New York Yankees. It, it's as simple as that. It wasn't because they liked the Yankees' farm system. It was also, again, because and had that no-trade clause and was basically down to four teams, and that was it. He wasn't going to the Cardinals. He wasn't going to the Giants. And so a limited field, and they found someone who would take the most amount of money. That was the New York Yankees. So is it accurate to say that the four teams that he told the Marlins to go talk to were the Yankees, Cubs, Dodgers, and Astros? Were those the four teams, Tom? I believe he didn't reveal that list specifically, but he did say, uh, he did mention the Dodgers. He did mention the Yankees, of course. He said the Yankees were on the top of his list. That's the way he put it. Uh, easy to say now that he signed, but probably was true given the fact that the Yankees now are ready-made to compete year after year for a while. I mean, you're talking about Sanchez, Bird, um, a judge, of course, and Stanton will be together at least, assuming Stanton doesn't opt out, for the next five years, at least five years together. All these guys right now in their 20s, uh, you're looking at a modern-day murderer's row. Tom Verducci joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. Earlier I said that Jeter was doing his job to perfection, Tom, and by that I mean the fact that he is a human shield for the owner of this team, That's the, or at least the majority owner of this team, and Bruce Sherman, uh, that, that, that he has taken all the heat of getting rid of Stanton and a lot of what's going on in the front office that's really ticking off fans there in South Florida. What do you say uh, to that supposition? Well, I think in some degree you're right. He is the face of the franchise right now, especially with Stanton no longer there. Um, and I think he's doing the right thing in terms of baseball architecture. You know, Stanton got up there today and he said, listen, I thought we had a good lineup. I think with some additions to our pitching staff, we could compete. Uh, that's not how today's game operates. You're either all in or you're not in at all. You don't want to be in the middle ground, and that's where the Marlins were for the last couple of years, actually. So you need to strip it all the way down. And that's what they're doing here. It's going to be painful the next few years. So as a business plan, it works. As a baseball franchise, you're a fan of the Marlins. It stinks. I mean, you just went through an ownership in Loria's group before where there was no connection with the city. You figure you get high hopes that a guy like Derek Jeter is coming in, that they're really going to try. The first thing they do is trade the franchise player. Uh, it's going to take a long time to win those people back, both on the field and off the field. So let's, let's, let's take a look up higher here then, Tom. Like, did baseball not know that when they approved this sale to this ownership group that uh, a fire sale would happen with their MVP in the National League? And, and if so, then why did they approve this sale? Why would they say yes to something like this? Uh, well, because they brought in the most money in terms of uh, the prospective owners, the most money on the table at Sherman's group. And I think they did know that this was coming because now we've seen the strip downs in Chicago. We've seen it used that it's going on now and uh, some other places, the White Sox, the Phillies, the Tigers will be next. You know, this is the cycle of the game, the boom and bust cycles that teams go through. And I think they knew, I think the Major League Baseball people knew, but, um, you know, listen, they had a chance to get Derek Jeter involved as well. Don't discount the marquee value of his name when, when a group comes to MLB and Derek Jeter is on the masthead of the ownership group, it's hard to leave him outside the door and not bring him in. And I'm sure the the sex appeal of Jeter's name had something to do with it, but it was mostly about the cash they brought to the table on the sale. Tom Verducci joining me here on the Rich Eisen Show. Okay, let's talk Otani. Uh, the hype is huge. 
calling him the uh, the the second coming to Babe Ruth, and the hype might get so large that we might find out that Babe Ruth was the American Otani. So, <laughs> how much of this hype should we believe, Tom? Uh, a lot of it. You know, the baseball people I've talked to, and this is now just going back even before he was available here as a free agent last year or two. I've been told that he could be an all-star pitcher. He could be an all-star hitter. Now, can he do both at the same time at that level? I think that's where the uh, the, the question is. I think he'll be an impact pitcher right away. I mean, he throws, he tops out at 102 miles an hour. Mm. I compare his stuff to Jacob DeGrom, except he's got a nasty split-fingered fastball. As a hitter, it to me it reminds me of Cody Bellinger. And I just don't know that you can beat Cody Bellinger when you're also pitching and you're DHing three times a week. It's going to be very difficult for him. I think he'll hit home runs, and I think he'll be dominant right away on the mound. But I think in time, I don't see him sticking with this. I mean, even Babe Ruth had to give it up. He said it was too much to do both. Well, maybe he just w- wouldn't drink every single other minute. <laughs> well, that would have helped. Yeah, I don't think you have to worry about that. This guy, but yeah, that would help. Yeah, and he doesn't have to take trains, you know, to, on road trips <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> so, do he, so the Angels just added someone with the stuff of Degrom and the bat of Cody Bellinger in one person, Tom. Yeah, it's fascinating. Oh. It really is. We have not, literally, we haven't seen it since Ruth. Anybody who actually started 15 games on the mound and started anywhere else in the lineup for 15 games, it's it's freakish. The combination of skills that this guy has. And the teams that I talked to, I talked to most of the teams, the seven teams in the in the final there, but most of all of them said they don't discount him doing this because he just seems so laser focused. Baseball is everything to this guy. He's certainly not about the big markets or the endorsements. He gave up essentially two hundred million dollars by coming here now rather than two years from now. So they think he has the skills to do it, the mindset to do it. I just think Physically, Rich, it's just gonna. It, it's tough. You know, the baseball here is different. The mound is different. It's a much harder, firmer mound. They have softer mounds over there. Recovery here, the travel here, everything is more stressful. Uh, I want to see him do it. I think it's a great thing. The Angels now have two of the most exciting players in baseball, mm-hmm. in Otani and Trout. They're a must-watch, as are the Yankees, of course. I hope he's able to succeed at doing it. Uh, I just think over time it's going to be very tough physically. Tom Verducci here on the Rich Eisen Show. What would you think of the uh, naming of Jack Morris and Alan Trammell, Tom? I liked it. I mean, I was a guy. I was in favor of Jack when he was on the ballot as a player. Um, it's the Hall of Fame. I, I understand his ERA is high. I, I never, I never really bought this narrative that he pitched to the score, and that's why his ERA was high. But if it was just about the numbers, we wouldn't need to vote. We would just you know, go by the numbers and put people in based on certain thresholds. But there is an element of fame to this guy. And it wasn't just Game 7 of 91. It's the fact that in his era, nobody was close. I'm saying nobody was close to him in terms of taking the ball deep into games, start in, start out, year in, year out. That's, to me, why he's a Hall of Famer. He was the ultimate, maybe the last true workhorse in Major League Baseball, and he did it for multiple teams that won. So I was happy for a guy who got up to 67% uh, on the writer's ballot to get in here. And Trammell, I was happy for him because I thought he was overshadowed by Ripken during his career. I just remember talking to Sparky Anderson about Tram. And, and Tram was, I didn't think he was a guy you appreciated watching him play one or two games like some superstar players. But as Sparky used to say, he is a manager's dream. He did everything well, fundamentally well, but at a high level, a very reliable player. And it's nice to see players of the 80s, especially former Tigers, who I think have been underrepresented, get that nod. So I thought it was great. And you know what, Rich? This is the first time in about 17 years that this committee or a form of it has voted in living players into the Hall of Fame. I, I think that's terrific. Rather than waiting until we lose these people, like Ron Santo, to honor them, um, hopefully this starts a new trend. Last one for you, Tom. Uh, what's next in the winter meetings? Are there are there uh, any ripples to the Stanton and Otani moves that are on, on the horizon? Um, or, or, or is it they could just treat that in a vacuum and the winter meetings are going to go along as expected? No, I think so. I think especially the teams that were in that final seven there need to obviously move on uh, after not getting Otani. I think that you'll see the pitching market fall first. The last couple of years, the, the market for hitters is absolutely cratered. Uh, and you see teams jumping up for relief pitching, especially Brandon Morrow going to the Cubs. 
I think you'll see more of those guys going here at the meetings than you do the bats, and then we'll see maybe trades later on. Um, but I'm not sure that we're going to see a great market. The ones to watch, obviously, J.D. Martinez and Eric Hosmer. To me, they're the two best hitters on the market and maybe two best all-around players. But I think that's going to be a slow-developing market. I mean, last year, at Encarnacion and Bautista, two really big bats. And, you know, it took forever for those markets to develop. So uh, I, I think the team I'm looking at now is the Red Sox, Rich. And I know you don't respond directly to your competitor, <laughs> But the Yankees now, to me, on paper, are better than Boston. And Boston needs to play today's game, which is hitting home runs. But like it or not, the ball is, is flying out of ballparks. The Yankees now have leveraged that baseball better than any, but any team in baseball. The Red Sox are way behind the curve in terms of power. So they're talking about possibly trading a Jackie Bradley Jr., maybe getting in J.D. Martinez. They need a couple of guys who can hit the ball out of the ballpark. So uh, the ball's in their court. Again, not directly responding to the Yankees, but they need to improve. Last one in 30 seconds, if you can. Uh, is Jeter there or is he not there? He's not here. <laughs> is that normal for this? Surprised. Is that is that normal for the CEO of a team to n- not be at the winter meetings? Well, not for the CEO, but for someone who really is making final baseball decisions, it's a little unusual that he's not here at all. Sometimes that guy, the point guy on baseball matters, will drop <laughs> in at least a day or two, you know, all four days. So, but it's not his style. He's got a very different style, as you know. I call it a detached style. He was that way as a player, and apparently he's going to be the same as an executive. Tom, always appreciate the time. We'll chat again hopefully very soon. Thanks for the call. Always a pleasure, Rich. Thanks. Right back at you, Tom Verducci. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.